I want to move on after that very uh, interesting introduction about the very early days uh, to uh, the period when it is clear that maritime travel, seafaring, was taking place. Uh, and uh, of course, we have no uh, hope uh, I think for many years of finding uh, Paleolithic boats or even difficult to find Neolithic boats. So uh, our evidence for seafaring uh, comes from uh, essentially in those very early days what we find on land. Uh, and uh, for the Aegean we have the wonderful opportunity uh, that one of the most useful materials um, which uh, was used uh, already, it seems, in Paleolithic times and very extensively uh, in Neolithic times was obsidian. Uh, and obsidian, as you know, is found in volcanic areas uh, throughout the world. Some of the earliest evidence for seafaring in the world at all comes from the Pacific. Uh, where uh, uh, outcrops of obsidian uh, are found and where obsidian was transported at an early date. Uh, but uh, as you know, the most important outcrop uh, of uh, uh, outcrops of obsidian uh, in the Aegean are on the island of Milos. Uh, and uh, it was an important discovery indeed uh, when uh, obsidian uh, artifacts uh, were found uh, in uh, Paleolithic, upper Paleolithic uh, levels uh, in the Frankie Cave uh, in the Argolid. There is uh, obsidian. It is uh, a volcanic glass. Uh, and uh, so uh, we... Uh, uh, thank you very much. That's much easier. Thank you. Um, and uh, so it's uh, very easy to uh, recognize. Uh, and those are typical examples. Uh, an early Bronze Age blade there and hand samples elsewhere. And here now uh, is a view of the Frankie Cave, which was uh, excavated by Tom Jacobson uh, and his colleagues uh, from the uh, 1960s onwards. Uh, and uh, in the Frankie Cave, and there you have uh, a view of uh, this uh, uh, formidable uh, uh, cave, one of the most uh, important uh, Paleolithic sites uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, and so uh, here you see some examples. Uh, and now we move to Milos, uh, where uh, it's very easy to uh, recognize the two principal uh, outcrops, uh, one of them uh, at uh, j just above Athamas in the great bay of Milos. Uh, and clearly, it's not enough if you find something that looks like obsidian or you can identify as obsidian uh, in Frankly, it's not enough uh, just to say that uh, this is obsidian so it has to come from Milos because as is well known there are other outcrops of obsidian in the Mediterranean, uh, there are uh, outcrops on the Lipari Islands and then there are also outcrops uh, in, uh, in the Balkans, um, in Slovakia and Hungary and then there are important outcrops also uh, in central Anatolia. Not to mention minor outcrops uh, uh, on the island of Antiparos uh, and also uh, at Yali in the uh, near Nisiros in the eastern Aegean. So the problem very soon becomes a very specific one of characterization. Can we demonstrate uh, that the uh, obsidian, in this case the obsidian found in the Frankie Cave, stratified in levels around 13,000 years ago, uh, can we demonstrate unequivocally that this does indeed come from the island of Milos? And there are the uh, uh, outcrops uh, uh, of obsidian, obsidian in situ, if you raise your eyes above those nice flowers, uh, to uh, the volcanic deposits containing uh, obsidian. Uh, and uh, also uh, at Demenegaki, and there you find a great scree of obsidian, and this is not uh, uh, obsidian as found in nature, this is the result uh, of obsidian being collected in prehistoric times and roughed out, and so this scree is a scree of obsidian that has already been processed uh, in a, a primary way in prehistoric times. 
But of course, it's very difficult to date uh, uh, just when that took place, just from an outcrop. That is why the uh, stratified examples uh, in the Frankly Cave are so very important. Well, already uh, 50 years ago, I initiated with Joe Can uh, a characterization study uh, on uh, uh, Mediterranean obsidians, extending also to uh, Anatolia and the Near East. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, gives you uh, an impression uh, of the problem. Uh, you see uh, Milos and Yali as two key sources, and the source labeled Adjigal up there, one of the Balkan sources, and across there, Lipari and the Pontine Islands and Pantelleria, and then uh, to the north, you see uh, some of the Balkan sources. So the problem was to collect obsidian from those sources uh, and subject it to an analysis which would allow you to distinguish the obsidians from the different sources, one from another. That is the characterization problem. Uh, and then, indeed, take obsidian from the Frankly Cave or from whichever other site where you have an archaeological context and see with which source it matches up. Well, there is the almost prehistoric piece of apparatus which we used 50 years ago for optical emission spectroscopy, uh, but it did the work. Uh, and I'm going to show you now uh, early results, but the point is the early results, I hope, remain valid. So, as you know, if you do a trace element analysis, uh, you get parts per million uh, of the various uh, elements that you're looking for. So you see uh, barium and strontium and zirconium and yttrium and niobium and lanthanum and rubidium uh, and all these various uh, elements uh, which you're uh, getting the concentrations of. And then when you compare the uh, trace element compositions of the different sources, and here is a very simple slide we produced 50 years ago for our first work, which was focusing at that time on the obsidian found in archaeological contexts in Malta. Uh, there you see uh, the, uh, uh, the source areas uh, colored, uh, and so you see obsidian of Lip the sources of Lipari and Palmarola at the bottom left, and Sardinia at the top, and Milos, this is the Milos sources in that gray area, uh, and they're distinguished on this slide simply by the concentration of zirconium in parts per million and barium in parts per million. And that allows you uh, to make uh, an ascription. Well, uh, uh, happily, uh, the obsidian from the Frankly Cave fell very clearly in the, uh, uh, in the uh, million uh, group there. And subsequent uh, uh, analyses, follow-up analyses, um, using neutron activation analysis and a series of other methods have confirmed those results uh, in a satisfactory way. So that uh, it can now be uh, documented firmly that the obsidian from Frankly uh, was transported evidently by sea uh, from Milos uh, to the Argolid from around uh, 13,000 years ago. Now, that, of course, uh, does not uh, tell us um, exactly by what means it was transported, and that remains uh, an issue for uh, the archaeology of today, which we'll move on to. Now, uh, as we ap approach the Neolithic period, of course, uh, the world changes not only have the sea levels changed, uh, but the wild plant and animal domesticates, um, largely in the Near East and in Eastern Anatolia, have been domesticated, so that you have wheat and barley and sheep and goat, uh, which uh, uh, are used, obviously, uh, around the Aegean in Greece uh, from the beginning of the Neolithic period, from around 7,000 BC, and you find uh, a number of significant developments. Making and using boats is clearly uh, something that was going on uh, in the Upper Paleolithic period in the Aegean. Uh, and uh, we have obviously new uh, shipping techniques and so on. And it's uh, significant to refer also in quite early days to metallurgical innovation. So here is the obsidian trade in the, uh, in the Neolithic. 
Uh, and uh, it is striking that you do find obsidian in nearly all early Neolithic sites in the Aegean. And that obsidian uh, generally turns out to be Melian obsidian, and so it was indeed transported by sea. Uh, you find it in very small quantities at uh, sites like Nea Nicomedia uh, in the north, uh, and uh, you do begin to find a few fragments of obsidian from those um, uh, Central European sources finding their way down to the fringes of the Aegean, but uh, essentially the, the picture uh, is that the obsidian used certainly in the early Neolithic period in the Aegean was transported from the island of Milos. You do find obsidian from Yali in small quantities, and also interestingly, you do find very small quantities of obsidian from the uh, central Anatolian sources. So one important conclusion, I think, is that marine mobility in boats of some kind was something uh, which was already uh, available before the onset of farming, before the onset of the Neolithic period. Uh, and uh, that is, I think, uh, an important conclusion. It's easy to underestimate uh, the, uh, the skills uh, of the early seafarers already in the Upper Paleolithic period. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's, uh, uh, there's no evidence so far uh, that Milos was uh, uh, already occupied in the early Neolithic period. So we must imagine seafarers from uh, the Argolid uh, going out to Milos, island hopping, no doubt. Um, and since you also find uh, uh, obsidian in the very earliest Neolithic levels in Crete, you must imagine seafarers from Crete going out to Milos to collect their uh, obsidian. Uh, and so those are important conclusions. Now, what were their boats like? Um, it's often suggested or assumed that maybe they use reed boats. Uh, and uh, these are examples from uh, Lake Titicaca in Peru, where you can certainly find very uh, uh, seaworthy, although it's an inland lake, but in general very seaworthy uh, reed boats uh, in that location. But I'm becoming increasingly skeptical uh, about the theory of reed boats. Certainly the very earliest uh, representations we have uh, of uh, boats from the Aegean uh, are more solid looking uh, vessels uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, the finds uh, uh, at Strophilus uh, are of, uh, on the island of Andros uh, by the excavations of Christina Televandu, I think are of fundamental importance because these are the earliest uh, 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 images we have of boats. They're engravings on the rock um, and they're of boats <clears throat> which resemble uh, the uh, uh, Cycladic longboats with which we are familiar from the Cycladic Early Bronze Age <clears throat> after 3000 BC. Uh, but uh, these uh, uh, particular engravings and Strophilas in general is from the final Neolithic period uh, and uh, some of these should date before 4000 BC. So uh, I think therefore uh, uh, we have uh, two clear indications of early seafaring. The first is the obsidian trade, uh, but then, of course, um, the arrival of domesticates was probably by sea. Certainly, when you're talking about the uh, island of Crete, uh, the first small cattle, sheep and goat, and the first large cattle, uh, proper cattle, um, uh, were transported by sea to Crete, probably from Caria, from southwestern Anatolia. Uh, and there was certainly a competence uh, in seafaring at that time. But I think that competence, um, we must imagine it going back to the Upper Paleolithic period uh, as the uh, obsidian evidence uh, makes so uh, abundantly clear. Well, the world widens with uh, the competence uh, in seafaring, which we certainly see in the early Bronze Age, and the quickening extent of trade, a marine trade in the early Bronze Age, is a clear documentation 
uh, of the seafaring skills which the islanders, uh, perhaps by this time certainly the Sicadic islanders, uh, since already from around 5000 BC uh, we find settlements, for instance the settlement of uh, uh, Saliagos uh, on Antiparos, uh, and so uh, we have permanent settlement in the Cyclades uh, from that time. Uh, and uh, uh, it's worth uh, emphasizing uh, that uh, it was a significant development when we see the first depictions of ships with sails uh, around 2000 BC in the Aegean. And it's very interesting that we have no direct evidence uh, of uh, ships with sails in the Aegean before that time. Uh, and so uh, until that time, we're talking about the Cycladic longboats, uh, which are so uh, uh, well documented, notably uh, from uh, the uh, so-called frying pans on, uh, found on the island of Syros. And these wonderful depictions, of which there are quite a few, uh, they're very well known, uh, but uh, they show uh, the long ships uh, of the Cycladic islanders, uh, which must have been, uh, as uh, Cyprian Brewbank has very well discussed, uh, must have been um, uh, a significant enterprise because you uh, need uh, 20 or so, so rowers to row these uh, ships, and so uh, they must have been uh, substantial uh, vessels. They were clearly seafaring vessels, but uh, they are uh, clearly a development of something that was already available uh, in the final Neolithic period, in the, in the final Paleolithic period. And I put on the screen at the top here two uh, model boats uh, of uh, lead uh, in the Ashmolean Museum, uh, which are supposed to have been discovered in an early Cycladic grave, uh, and they give uh, uh, a further indication of how these, uh, these boats uh, may have looked. These boat models give a useful indication. And then I put on uh, here uh, a couple of sherds uh, from Philokopi in Milos, the one on the left uh, giving an indication of uh, uh, seafaring, but the one on the right, one of the earliest indications we have uh, of uh, um, a ship which would have been a sailing ship, and that's from the first city at Philokopi, which is probably around uh, uh, 2000 BC or thereabouts. And it was at this time, uh, in the early Bronze Age, from around 2700 BC, that you find a remarkable quickening in the contacts. And you find a whole series of forms uh, which are widely seen uh, throughout the Aegean. Uh, and uh, they probably imitate metal vessels. You don't find many source boats of gold like the one on the left although fortunately they exist, and you don't find many two-handled cups like this one uh, of uh, silver uh, on the left, but you find plenty of them in pottery, as you see uh, on the right-hand side. And the, the source boat becomes a light motif, not only for mainland Greece, but for the Cycladic uh, islands, and is found also uh, in Crete, but much more rarely uh, on the Anatolian coast, from around 2700 BC onwards. Uh, and then a little later, the uh, two-handled cup there, the so-called Depes cup, which is an Anatolian form, also becomes very widespread. And uh, I think we should imagine uh, that it was the metal prototypes, which fortunately do exist, as you see there, uh, which uh, inspired the ceramic versions, which one finds so widely. So there is the... Uh, the gold source boat uh, in the Louvre, conserved in the Louvre, and there is one of the many uh, imitations uh, which, uh, which here we see from the island of Naxos. And so uh, if you look at a distribution map of some of the key forms, the source boat there, or the Depas cup, or indeed the one handle cup, they are very widely spread in what becomes a kind of international spirit uh, in the Aegean from around 2700 BC. Uh, and a key form also is the marble folded arm figurine of the Cycladic Islands, uh, which brings me to my uh, second uh, main theme uh, this morning. Uh, here is uh, one of these splendid 
uh, uh, sculptures, often called figurines, uh, which are uh, so widely found. Uh, and just in recent years, um, with the support and approval of the Greek Archaeological Service uh, and the support of the British School at Athens, uh, I've been conducting an excavation on the island of Keros, uh, where we found uh, remarkable uh, deposits uh, containing broken Cycladic figurines, which are clearly uh, uh, deposited in what one may regard as a ritual context, which uh, has led us to claim uh, Keros as the earliest maritime sanctuary in the world. It was a sanctuary because people were bringing these deposits from the different islands. It's clearly maritime because Keros is a small island and these materials were being brought from elsewhere. Uh, and uh, it, it was uh, um, the earliest maritime sanctuary uh, because uh, the other important sanctuaries, there are plenty of uh, places that you can regard as sanctuaries in Crete or mainland Greece, even from Neolithic times. Uh, but uh, I'm not aware of any uh, one in the world older than uh, Keros where the approach had to be by sea. Obviously, Delos is a later example, but that is two millennia later. So there is the uh, island of Keros, seen from nearby Kufonisi, and there is uh, the little island of Daskalio, the islet of Daskalio, which turns out to be the settlement. And in the foreground, you see the excavations um, at Kavos on, uh, on Keros. Uh, here was the site when uh, I first visited it in 1963, and it was in that year that uh, Professor Christos Dumas began his rescue excavations because uh, the site had been extensively looted in the previous decade with uh, extraordinary quantities, it seems, of course, we don't know exactly what, but such a lot of material appeared on the market subsequently, the international illicit market, uh, that it was clear uh, the looting was on uh, a considerable scale. And on my visit in 1963, just for a, a few uh, hours sherding, I found all these fragments of marble. And you don't usually find marble fragments when you're uh, undertaking a surface survey uh, in the Cycladic Islands. Uh, and so these are now in the Naxos Museum, of course. And here is a view uh, of Carvos from Vascalio, the islet of Vascalio. And here is our uh, excavation underway. Uh, and uh, we found fragments, this is a very typical example, we found fragments of broken pottery, broken marble bowls, broken figurines um, in great quantities. Uh, and it was clear uh, when we obviously sieved, we water sieved and so on, first of all, they were not associated with burials. The water sieving didn't produce bones or teeth. Uh, they were clearly deposited uh, in some kind of bundles, bundles of material were deposited. They were clearly brought from other islands, and above all, they were not broken in situ. When we set out to reconstruct these things, we found a few joins, but very few. They were brought already broken from other islands. And there are some of the fragments of uh, source boats uh, and uh, uh, abundant pottery of uh, various kinds. Here is a distribution map of the more than 500 figurine fragments we found in the Special Deposit South. And here are the fragments of just one variety, the Spethos variety of figurine. There are other ty varieties typologically, and that just gives you uh, an idea of what we were finding. Uh, and there were no significant structures uh, at Carvos. Uh, and we had the good fortune of digging in an undisturbed part of the site. Uh, and we found just a few lines of stones, uh, and uh, uh, among them were these uh, fragments. For instance, there is one uh, such uh, fragment uh, of the uh, part of the torso of a very large figure. Uh, this is not from our excavation. This is uh, from the, the largest known from the National Museum uh, in Athens, a uh, figure more than uh, a meter high, but we were finding fragments, fragments only, of figures that had been as high as one meter, as uh, originally when, when complete. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's clear uh, that 
the role of these sculptures, these so-called figurines, was not only, or maybe not primarily, for inhumation in cemeteries, where they've been found since the time of Tsuntas onwards, uh, but part of it was to perhaps break them when they went out of use. They must have been ritually broken in their places of use, and then uh, some fragments were brought on a whole series of occasions over several centuries to the island of Keros, to the sanctuary on Keros for inhumation. And there are some of the fragments of marble bowls. Now, it's not easy to break a marble bowl. You can break it in two without much difficulty, but it took a lot of trouble to break the marble vessels uh, into such small fragments. So there's a very interesting ritual of breakage uh, which we are documenting here. Now, I mustn't uh, overrun my time. I'm aware of uh, our chairman's warning, and I'm uh, reaching, uh, re get moving towards my conclusion. But I just remind you that from these painted figures, uh, which exist in the National Museum and the museum in Copenhagen, it's clear uh, that these uh, sculptures were painted, uh, and uh, work that's been undertaken by uh, Getz Gentle and uh, uh, her followers have suggested they were painted several times. It's clear then that they were used in processions, I believe, in the places uh, where they were used, in the Cycladic villages, uh, and then they were, uh, they were ritually broken and then sometimes brought to, uh, to Keros. Here is the settlement at Lascalio. Uh, that's an aerial view of the settlement. And here are some of the uh, buildings which we uh, recovered. But I want to draw your attention just to one point in particular with these buildings. Uh, and uh, I won't trouble you with the uh, chronology. We're in pre we've published our first volume. The second volume is in press. And the third volume, I hope, will be ready by the end of this year. Uh, it is the case that the islet of Vascalio was probably joined by a land bridge with Keros itself during the early Bronze Age. So what we were just hearing about sea level change is very, very relevant to that theme, but it's not my main theme uh, this morning. It's very interesting that on the island of Vascalio, uh, we found quite a few marble figurines, of which you see a good selection here, mainly complete, but not a single fragment of the folded arm form was found on the island of Vascalio, although we found more than 500 fragments uh, at the sanctuary side on Carvos opposite, and uh, many more, I'm sure, uh, ha have been looted from there. Uh, we had a, a lot of evidence of uh, daily life uh, at Vascalio, which I'm not going to tell you about now. I want to finish, though, with one interesting point. Our geologist, uh, John Dixon, who sadly passed away last year, but he completed his research. Uh, and uh, the marble for the walls that we found uh, on Vascalio, it turned out uh, that nearly all that marble was imported uh, because there's no good quality marble on Keros itself, was imported from Naxos about 12 kilometers away. And that's a lot of marble and that's uh, a lot of seafaring that you have to undertake. So there has not been much discussion about rafts uh, when we talk uh, about early Cycladic seafaring, uh, but uh, I presume that the craft which were used to tow the marble that was quarried on Naxos to Keros must have been brought in some seagoing vessel, most, most probably uh, a raft, and this is a further documentation of the mastery of the sea, because to transport building materials by sea is a, ve is a very sophisticated undertaking. And so they must have very much wanted to construct their settlement uh, on Keros, on Vascalio on Keros, otherwise they'd have built it much closer to the, uh, uh, to the sources of the marble on Naxos. So there, this is, uh, I'm approaching my uh, uh, final slides. Now there is, uh, the sanctuary uh, on Keros, a more romantic view of it. Uh, and there are some of the links. We have Im importation imports to Keros from many places, although not interestingly from Crete. 
And that's an interesting theme that uh, at this time there are quite a few indications of Cycladic influence in Crete, including marble figurines, yet we are not finding imports from Crete uh, to uh, Keros. I don't know why, but that's an observation uh, that I would make. And so uh, this is not from our excavation, but this is an earlier find from the island of Keros, and we have found on Keros fragments of these things, um, and so uh, I think we're beginning to get a, a view of the wider world the maritime world uh, in which uh, these wonderful sculptures were made and uh, then they were broken and then they were uh, deposited at this uh, earliest maritime sanctuary. So that is a, a precursor to what I'm sure we're going to hold, uh, hear about now from other speakers who will talk uh, about uh, uh, the further developing world of the Aegean but the foundations for that world uh, were laid already uh, in the Upper Paleolithic with the seafarers of the Upper Paleolithic uh, and then with the, uh, our maritime uh, uh, sailors uh, of the early Bronze Age uh, in, uh, in the Cycladic Islands as documented by the finds from our sanctuary. Thank you very much.